We are certainly facing an incredible decision this coming Tuesday as believers in Jesus Christ. It's, it's been a goldmine for late night comedians though, this whole political season. Personally, I have found that there's a big problem with political jokes because they can end up getting elected. I've wanted to deal with this topic for quite some time. I, I want to talk to you today about honoring God with your vote. My suspicion would be that you might have thought that my title would have been, For Whom Should Christians Vote? My goal today is not to speak to you politically, although I'm going to talk about politics. I want to speak to you theologically. That's my task. And if you were to come to my office and talk to me about something in your personal life that was in shambles and it was in disarray and, and you're lost and you don't know which way to turn or where to go and, and you said, Pastor Mike, you need to give me some help. Well, I would take out my Bible and I would identify the causes of your personal dilemma and I would speak God's truth into that dilemma. I would, I would try to give you God's resolution for whatever it is that is causing your life to be in shambles. Now, if you came to me and your family was in shambles, I would, I would go to the Bible and I would find the resolution from God's Word for the matter for your family. Say I had a friend that is in ministry and he calls me about his church that is in shambles and I would take the same Bible that I use for the individual that I use for the family and I would open that up and I would help that individual find God's words related to that matter in his church which is in shambles. Well, what do you do when a country is in shambles, when the citizenry is in an uproar, when, when there is true division amongst the people and they don't know which way to go. Well, what most people do is they, they change books. I'm not going to change books today. If it's good enough for the individual, and if it's good enough for the family, and if it's good enough for the church that is in shambles, then it is not insufficient for the society that is in shambles. But I would like to suggest to you today that God is involved in this election more than you might think. It might be hard for us to grasp that, so we'll go down this line of biblical reasoning. My sermon today is, is not geared to get you to say amen. What it is designed to do is inform your vote. Now, I do not expect from what I'm going to share with you that everyone is going to vote the same. My goal is to put God at the forefront of your elective choice. We read in the 13th chapter of Romans, verse 1, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now please note that first word, everyone. That means you are not an exception. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. And the reason is because there is no authority except that which God has established. And those that exist are established by God. Now, when I bring the Bible into the government discussion, the Bible says there is no government but God. There is no authority but God. And those governments that are in place exist by the establishment of God. And I think verse 1 wants you to know that there should be, particularly for the Christian, you, you cannot discuss government without discussing God. And the reason why, he says, is because, write this down, government is a divine institution. Now, the problem is, people don't want the divine in the institution. 
Because once you introduce God seriously, and I'm not talking about merely saying God bless America, once you introduce God seriously into the discussion, it changes the nature of the discussion. You see, you have to discuss things differently. You go beyond God bless America and, and you bring God into the discussion. Socialism, communism, they do not want God brought into the discussion. So what they do is they, they suppress religion to keep God out of the discussion because socialism and communism understand that if, if God is allowed in the discussion, it will affect everything. Now, a lot of people in America want, want to say to Christians, well, what you want to do is you want to change America into a theocracy. And the entire premise of that statement is wrong. Every governmental system, as we have already noted, is a theocracy. The real question is, who is Theo? Listen, God establishes for us that he is responsible for government. The Bible declares in Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Daniel chapter 4, verse 26 says that heaven rules over the earth. God rules over the nations. That's a statement you can read over and over and over in the Psalms. So, so let's get something straight. The world already is a theocracy. God rules. It's too late to argue against that. You are, you are arguing against something that already exists because God already rules. Now the question is, how does God rule? The question is not whether or not God rules. The question is, how does he rule? God's sovereignty on his rule is established and it operates worldwide, universally over every person, every family, every church, every nation, no matter what it is, God rules. That means ultimately that there is only one governing authority. That is why at the beginning of verse one he says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. Please notice that is plural. Why are there governing authorities? Because there is only one governing authority. There is only one governing authority, and he rules through the governing authorities. The reason why the one governing authority rules through a multiplicity of governing authorities is because no human authority can ever give the impression that they are the authority. Whenever a leader or a governmental system claims deity and a governmental system claims deity when it rises to a point of trying to be everything for the people. Only God can be everything for the people. So there are, there are four different levels of, of government over which God rules. The first is self-government. That's why it says Everyone. Some translations actually read every person. The goal of government is to govern yourself because when citizens govern themselves, there is no need for someone else to be governing over them. So, so the goal is self-government. That is why the Bible says that every person will give an account for themselves to God. The second level of government is family government. Families have a, a very specific jurisdiction. The parents oversee or govern their children. The Bible teaches that the husband is the head of the wife. There's, there's an organizational structure for how the family is supposed to be governed God's way. Well, then there's church government. There, there are to be elders who oversee or govern the people of the congregation. There, there are deacons who assist in this measure with the elders. The, the spiritual health and responsibility of the, the, the spiritual care of the church rests in the hands of the shepherds that, that God has placed with this flock to be into their care. And finally, where we're focused today is civil government. The problem is that man wants to make the civil government an arena 
devoid of the rule of God. And when man sets itself up in this manner, he will face the judgment of God. So we need to make sure that our leaders do not turn the government into something beyond what the government was meant to be. That is why the Bible says, call no man your father. That is, call no man your source. Call no man or no entity as the thing that you, you look to to provide everything that you need because you just called that man God. And the moment that you call somebody God that is not God, you just ask God to judge that somebody. So all I'm trying to say is this, write this down. There is only one government because there is only one God. Everything else comes underneath that statement. Now, how you come underneath that statement will determine how well your government runs and how effective you are as a citizen living under that government. Therefore, for whom should you vote on Tuesday? No. How should you vote? Here it is. You should vote for the candidate, the, the platform, the party that is going to best represent the values of the kingdom of God. That's it. You vote for the person, the platform, and the party, and you have to consider all three that will best represent the values of the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about how to do that, but that is what you are after. Why do you want the person, the party, and the platform that will best represent the kingdom of God? Because that will determine how God relates to that government and those systems. The closer that you line up, the more benefits you receive. The, the less you line up, the less benefits you receive. It really is as simple as that, and it is as complicated as that. That there are candidates from both parties that represent values that are antithetical to the kingdom of God. Democrats and Republicans have both betrayed the values of the kingdom of God on differing occasions. That is why I cannot tell you who to vote for, but you better fight for the values of the kingdom of God because that is going to determine how God relates to our culture and our country, and it is that way everywhere. Look at how Paul continues his thought in Romans 13, verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. We have been introduced to something here that is just as unpopular as the rest of our teaching, and that is good and evil. He says that the government has one overarching job. We can break everything the government does, civil government that is, down to one sentence. Underneath God, the civil government is supposed to promote the well-being of the citizenry for good and to protect the citizenry from the proliferation of evil. Now listen, when the government does more than that, it is usually infringing on another governmental system. When the government tries to be your mama or your daddy, when the, when the government is asked to do what you are going to be taxed to pay for beyond what God has described is its responsibility, that the government has become more than the government was ever designed to do. The Bible says that parents are to oversee the education of their children, not the government. The Bible says that the parents are supposed to provide for their children, not the government. The Bible says that if a man will not work, he should not eat. He should not get a welfare check. We're talking, not talking about cannot work. We're talking about will not work. If a man will not work, you don't give him a welfare check to pay for irresponsibility. You don't look to the government to pay for laziness because you and I are taxed for the payment of that laziness. Now, 
The question we need to answer is, how will the government know what is good versus what is evil? On what basis will it make a decision of, well, this is good and this is bad. This is right and this is wrong. Listen, if you vote wrong and you vote God out and you are no longer in alignment with God, then the blessing that would come along with voting right is something that you actually lose, even if the majority of people vote that way. So how do you determine good and evil? We go all the way back to the garden. God told Adam and Eve, from every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of, of good and evil, do not eat or you will die. Live by what I say. That's, that's why, here it is, that's why the government needs the church. The reason why the government needs the church is to inform it about what God thinks about a matter. This is, this is tied to God. It is not just who you vote for. Like the solutions to the American problems are going to land on Air Force One. That is not going to happen. When you go against God, since he is the ultimate government, he is going to respond governmentally. That is why alignment with God is so critical. It's not just about a person or a party. The issue is how is God going to respond to a culture where the majority of the people veto him? Because God says, the only authority is his. Everybody else is delegated authority for good or for bad. So God will allow people to elect evil into office. He is responding and he will allow that to be elected, which ultimately brings death because you did not want his government. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. If a nation is going to be exalted, then there is going to have to then it is going to have to be operating by God's standards. When when it dismisses those standards and goes away from God's instructions. There is, there is a reproach that is built into the culture. So, so go back to Romans. Look at verse 4 from Romans chapter 13. For it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. We don't have time to unpack all of that. But go back and read the first chapter of Romans 1 where Paul discusses the wrath of God. The very interesting thing is that Paul says in Romans 1 that the wrath of God is, is built into the process of the decay of a society. It isn't merely a punitive reaction from God. It's not a capricious reaction. It is a built-in consequence. It is the way that the system has been designed, that when you go against God, the wrath of God reacts. It is stirred up because it's built into the very fabric of the process. Paul says, that the king does not bear the sword for nothing. So, so God judges, and he judges through people based on his standard of right and wrong, or good and evil, which is not founded on human opinion, but on divine revelation. And he says, it is a minister of God. Look at verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So from verse 4, a government leader is called a minister, and they are called a servant in verse 6. And, and you thought ministers were only behind pulpits. Well, some countries refer to government offices as the minister of finance or the minister of education, and that is where this whole thought comes from. It comes from a biblical frame of reference. They are supposed to be servants and ministers of God. That is why God told the king in Israel, Deuteronomy 13, King 
You read my word every day. Tell your people to read my word every single day. And when everybody is reading my word every day, that means this thing is going to work for everybody. But civil government has moved further and further and further away from God to the point that we are spectators of the devolution of society. And the reason for it is because God's government, His rule, is being assaulted by the very people that we are electing into office. God will always resist man's attempt through a civil government to be God, little g. The Bible says that, they, that we are to obey God rather than man. So when the government asks you to obey it over God, you disobey it and you obey God. You do not treat the government like God. And when you approach the voting booth this coming Tuesday, you, you need to do so with the understanding that that you are a citizen of another kingdom. And if you participate in and are willful accomplices to the overthrowing and assaulting of God's rule, then you will get exactly what you vote for if you do that. We live for the kingdom of God. God always takes his cue from his people. If he sees us as no longer pre representing his kingdom, if he, if he sees his people with no peculiarity from the world, if we, if we look the same, if we act the same, if we vote the same as the world around us, then nothing, my friend, is holding back his wrath, and it is already on a fiber optic thin thread line. Choose wisely. Honor God and seek His kingdom first. Rescue the life of the unborn child in the womb. Protect the nature of and the institution of marriage and the family that God has so preciously designed. Fight for what is right. Find yourself standing with your forefathers before you, those who knew that without a moral people, there is no way our Constitution will ever be able to stand. 